Section 19 of History of Egypt, Volume 2, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 2. The Memphite Empire, Part 7. All that lay beyond Puanit was held to be a fabulous region, a kind of intermediate boundary land between the world of man and that of the gods, the island of the double, land of the shades, where the living came into close contact with the souls of the departed. It was inhabited by the Dangas, tribes of half-savage dwarves, whose grotesque faces and wild gestures reminded the Egyptians of the god Bisu, Bes. The chances of war or trade brought some of them from time to time to Puanit, or among the Amamiu, the merchant who succeeded in acquiring and bringing them to Egypt had his fortune made. Pharaoh valued the Dangas highly, and was anxious to have some of them at any price among the dwarves with whom he loved to be surrounded. None knew better than they the dance of the god, that to which Bisu unrestrainedly gave way in his merry moments. Towards the end of his reign, Asi procured one which a certain Biradidi had purchased in Puanit. Was this the first which had made its appearance at court, or had others preceded it in the good graces of the pharaohs? His wildness and activity, and the extraordinary positions which he assumed, made a lively impression upon the courtiers of the time, and nearly a century later there were still reminiscences of him. A great official born in the time of Shopsiskaf, and living on to a great age in the reign of Nafiririkiri, is described on his tomb as the scribe of the House of Books. This simple designation, occurring incidentally among two higher titles, would have been sufficient in itself to indicate the extraordinary development which Egyptian civilization had attained at this time. The House of Books was doubtless, in the first place, a depository of official documents, such as the registers of the survey and taxes, the correspondence between the court and the provincial governors or feudal lords, deeds of gift to temples or individuals, and all kinds of papers required in the administration of the state. It contained, also, however, literary works, many of which even at this early date were already old, prayers drawn up during the first dynasties, devout poetry belonging to times prior to the misty personage called Mini, hymns to the gods of light, formulas of black magic, collections of mystical works, such as the Book of the Dead and the Ritual of the Tomb, scientific treatises on medicine, geometry, mathematics, and astronomy, manuals of practical morals, and lastly, romances, or those marvellous stories which preceded the romance among Oriental peoples. All these, if we had them, would form a library much more precious to us than that of Alexandria. Unfortunately, up to the present, we have been able to collect only insignificant remains of such rich stores. In the tombs have been found here and there fragments of popular songs. The pyramids have furnished almost intact a ritual of the dead, which is distinguished by its verbosity, its numerous pious platitudes, and obscure allusions to things of the other world but among all this trash are certain portions full of movement and savage vigor, in which poetic glow and religious emotion reveal their presence in a mass of mythological phraseology. In the Berlin papyrus we may read the end of a philosophic dialogue between an Egyptian and his soul, in which the latter applies himself to show that death has nothing terrifying to man. I say to myself every day, as is the convalescence of a sick person, who goes to the court after his affliction, such is death, I say to myself every day, as is the inhaling of the scent of a perfume, as a seat under the protection of an outstretched curtain, on that day such is death. I say to myself every day, as the inhaling of the odor of a garden of flowers, as a seat upon the mountain of the country of intoxication, such is death. I say to myself every day, as a road which passes over the flood of inundation, as a man who goes as a soldier whom nothing resists, such is death. I say to myself every day, as the clearing again of the sky, as a man who goes out to catch birds with a net, and suddenly finds himself in an unknown district, such is death. Another papyrus, presented by Priest d'Alven to the Bibliothèque Nationale, Paris, contains the only complete work of their primitive wisdom which has come down to us. It was certainly transcribed before the eighteenth dynasty, and contains the works of two classic writers, one of whom is assumed to have lived under the third, and the other under the fifth dynasty. It is not without reason, therefore, that it has been called the oldest book in the world. 
the first leaves are wanting, and the portion preserved has, towards its end, the beginning of a moral treatise attributed to Quanimi, a contemporary of Huni. Then followed a work now lost, one of the ancient possessors of the papyrus having effaced it with the view of substituting for it another piece, which was never transcribed. The last fifteen pages are occupied by a kind of pamphlet, which has had a considerable reputation, under the name of the Proverbs of Ptahotpu. This Ptahotpu, a king's son, flourished under Menkahori and Asi. His tomb is still to be seen in the necropolis of Saqqara. He had sufficient reputation to permit the ascription to him, without violence to probability, of the editing of a collection of political and moral maxims, which indicate a profound knowledge of the court and of men generally. It is supposed that he presented himself, in his declining years, before the pharaoh Asi, exhibited to him the piteous state to which old age had reduced him, and asked authority to hand down for the benefit of posterity the treasures of wisdom, which he had stored up in his long career. The nomarch Ptahatpu says, Sire, my lord, when age is at that point, and decrepitude has arrived, debility comes and a second infancy, upon which misery falls heavily every day. The eyes become smaller, the ears narrower, strength is worn out while the heart continues to beat. The mouth is silent and speaks no more. The heart becomes darkened and no longer remembers yesterday. The bones become painful. Everything which was good becomes bad. Taste banishes entirely. Old age renders a man miserable in every respect, for his nostrils close up, and he breathes no longer, whether he rises up or sits down. If the humble servant who is in thy presence receives an order to enter on a discourse befitting an old man, then I will tell to thee the language of those who know the history of the past, of those who have heard the gods. For if thou conductest thyself like them, discontent shall disappear from among men, and the two lands shall work for thee. The majesty of this god says, Instruct me in the language of old times, for it will work a wonder for the children of the nobles. Whosoever enters and understands it, his heart weighs carefully what it says, and it does not produce satiety. We must not expect to find in this work any great profundity of thought. Clever analysis, subtle discussions, metaphysical abstractions, were not in fashion in the time of Ptahatpu. Actual facts were preferred to speculative fancies. Man himself was the subject of observation, his passions, his habits, his temptations, and his defects, not for the purpose of constructing a system therefrom, but in the hope of reforming the imperfections of his nature and of pointing out to him the road to fortune. Ptahatpu, therefore, does not show much invention or make deductions. He writes down his reflections just as they occur to him, without formulating them or drawing any conclusion from them as a whole. Knowledge is indispensable to getting on in the world. Hence he recommends knowledge. Gentleness to subordinates is politic, and shows good education, hence he praises gentleness. He mingles advice throughout on the behavior to be observed in the various circumstances of life, on being introduced into the presence of a haughty and choleric man, on entering society, on the occasion of dining with a dignitary, on being married. If thou art wise, thou wilt go up into thine house and love thy wife at home. Thou wilt give her abundance of food, thou wilt clothe her back with garments, all that covers her limbs her perfumes, is the joy of her life. As long as thou lookest to this, she is a profitable field to her master. To analyze such a work in detail is impossible. It is still more impossible to translate the whole of it. The nature of the subject, the strangeness of certain precepts, the character of the style, all tend to disconcert the reader and to mislead him in his interpretations. From the earliest times ethics has been considered as a healthy and praiseworthy subject in itself, but so hackneyed was it that a change in the mode of expressing it could alone give it freshness. Ptahatpu is a victim to the exigencies of the style he adopted. Others before him had given utterances to the truths he wished to convey. He was obliged to clothe them in a startling and interesting form to arrest the attention of his readers. In some places he has expressed his thought with such subtlety that the meaning is lost in the jingle of the words. The art of the Memphite dynasties has suffered as much as the literature from the hand of time, but in the case of the former the fragments are at least numerous and accessible to all. 
the kings of this period erected temples in their cities, and not to speak of the chapel of the Sphinx, we find in the remains still existing of those buildings chambers of granite, alabaster, and limestone, covered with religious scenes like those of more recent periods, although in some cases the walls are left bare. Their public buildings have all, or nearly all, perished. Breaches have been made in them by invading armies or by civil wars, and they have been altered, enlarged, and restored scores of times in the course of ages. But the tombs of the old kings remain, and afford proof of the skill and perseverance exhibited by the architects in devising and carrying out their plans. Many of the mastabas occurring at intervals between Giza and Medum have, indeed, been hastily and carelessly built, as if by those who were anxious to get them finished, or who had an eye to economy. We may observe in all of them neglect and imperfection, all the trade tricks which an unscrupulous jerry-builder then, as now, could be guilty of, in order to keep down the net cost and satisfy the natural parsimony of his patrons, without lessening his own profits. Where, however, the master mason has not been hampered by being forced to work hastily or cheaply, he displays his conscientiousness, and the choice of materials, the regularity of the courses, and the homogeneousness of the building leave nothing to be desired. The blocks are adjusted with such precision that the joints are almost invisible, and the mortar between them has been spread with such a skilful hand that there is scarcely an appreciable difference in its uniform thickness. The long, low, flat mass which the finished tomb presented to the eye is wanting in grace, but it has the characteristics of strength and indestructibility well suited to an eternal house. The façade, however, was not wanting in a certain graceful severity. The play of light and shade distributed over its surface by the stela, niches, and deep-set doorways, varied its aspect in the course of the day, without lessening the impression of its majesty and serenity, which nothing could disturb. The pyramids themselves are not, as we might imagine, the coarse and ill-considered reproduction of a mathematical figure disproportionately enlarged. The architect who made an estimate for that of Cheops must have carefully thought out the relative value of the elements contained in the problem which had to be solved, the vertical height of the summit, the length of the sides on the ground line, the angle of pitch, the inclination of the lateral faces to one another, before he discovered the exact proportions and the arrangement of lines which render his monument a true work of art, and not merely a costly and mechanical arrangement of stones. The impressions which he desired to excite have been felt by all who came after him when brought face to face with the pyramids. From a great distance they appear like mountain peaks, breaking the monotony of the Libyan horizon. As we approach them, they apparently decrease in size, and seem to be merely unimportant inequalities of ground on the surface of the plain. It is not till we reach their bases that we guess their enormous size. The lower courses then stretch seemingly into infinity to right and left, while the summit soars up out of our sight into the sky. The effect is gained by majesty and simplicity of form, in the contrast and disproportion between the stature of man and the immensity of his handiwork. The eye fails to take it in. It is even difficult for the mind to grasp it. We see, we may touch hundreds of courses formed of blocks, two hundred cubic feet in size, and thousands of others scarcely less in bulk, and we are at a loss to know what force has moved, transported, and raised so great a number of colossal stones, how many men were needed for the work, what amount of time was required for it, what machinery they used, and in proportion to our inability to answer these questions, we increasingly admire the power which regarded such obstacles as trifles. End of section 19. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.